The psychological phenomenon of capture serves as a rich area of convergence between the patristic tradition and modern sciences of the mind. According to the former, the capacity of logismoi, that is, the thoughts of the mind, the random thoughts, their capacity to hook into our minds and drive behaviors explains much of our psychological and spiritual dysfunction. According to the latter, a large amount of psychological distress arises from internal processes that rivet attention to the contents of consciousness, sensations, emotions, thoughts, fantasies, and memories, and diminish our capacity to voluntarily reorient focus. Psychiatrist David Kessler identifies capture as the mechanism whereby an appearance within the mind consumes attention and then sculpts perception and resulting behaviors, viewing it as a universal contributing factor in all forms of psychiatric illness. The capture process leads to a narrowing of the spotlight of attention, a tunnel vision, accompanied by a subjective sense of loss of volitional control and a change in the global feeling state. Once capture gains momentum, memory recall becomes distorted and imaginary simulations, often catastrophic ones, are kicked into hypergear. The resulting entrenchment of thoughts, emotional reactions, and behaviors places severe constraints on the expression of authentic personal freedom. The early Christian monastic tradition has preserved a detailed four-stage model of how capture unfolds. Monks were instructed to thoroughly understand capture's mechanisms to better resist harmful logismoi. The first stage, provocation, suggestion, involves a vaguely defined impulse or a combination of an image, thought, affect complex emerging into consciousness. Ivan Konsevich summarizes it in his overview of the Eastern Christian ascetical tradition as follows. Under the influence of external impressions, or in connection with the psychological working of memory or imagination according to the laws of association, provocation enters. This first moment takes place independent of free will in accordance with the laws of psychological inevitability, spontaneity. At the next stage, conjunction dialogue, a sympathetic inclination attracts attention, allowing the suggested thought to grow and turn into an image of fantasy pervading the entire sphere of consciousness and ousting all other impressions and thoughts. Following this consent joining, at this point, the initial suggestion has gained internal approval in shaping one's subjective reality, which may now be consummated in an overt act once the appropriate situation presents itself. Using modern terminology, cognitive fusion has occurred. In the final stage, total captivity occurs. This culmination further cements and solidifies this particular passion, making its traces all the more indelible and likely to be reactivated in the future. These stages unfold rapidly yet they also indicate distinct psychological phases where attention and consciousness can perturb and destabilize the gathering momentum. Awareness itself appears to hold a degree of veto power to abort the entire chain of events. 
Although this vetoing function becomes increasingly less likely, the further along the initial suggestion has penetrated. A combined neuropsychological model that integrates this ascetical science of captivity with modern findings holds the promise of enhancing our understanding of the neurobiological correlates accompanying the various stages and potentially exploring novel methods to strengthen one's capacity to resist obsessive thought loops or addictive behaviors. Asceticism, also called ascesis, literally meaning training, describes an ancient set of volitional practices aimed at a radical and enduring transformation. But a transformation of what? First, a thoroughgoing transformation of one's consciousness and subjectivity, encompassing all aspects of the self, including both conscious and unconscious components of the psyche, as well as the body. Second, a transformation in one's patterns of intentionality and relationships with other living beings. And finally, a transformation in one's characteristic ways of experiencing and existing in the world and the cosmos at large. Various forms of spiritual exercises appear to have focused on attaining voluntary control over attention and maintaining ceaseless vigilance or watchfulness, also called nepsis in the Eastern Orthodox monastic tradition, over one's entire inner life to ultimately attain authentic inner freedom. Ancient Egyptian schools, for instance, emphasized that lacking a discipline of continual inner watchfulness, humans lapse into a hypnotic-like state of consciousness, owing to the automaticity of much of our cognition, emotion, and behavior. Most of the world's sacred traditions regard attention as a vital force. Modern neurobiology confirms that attention drives blood flow and metabolic activity, boosts single neuron firing, and amplifies the brain's electromagnetic output at the level of large-scale neuronal populations, induces changes in gene expression, and directs structural and functional forms of neuroplasticity. Thus, there exists a strong connection between asceticism and a heightened sense of liberation from mechanical and impersonal laws that would otherwise severely constrain human freedom. For Christians, the inner life has consistently served as the primary battleground of ascetic struggle. A cornerstone of Christian monasticism, notably evident in Sinite sources, involves monks confronting the logismoi and passions while striving to transform their hearts and minds to resemble Christ. Inbar Graver concludes that these early monks' main concern was not the body, but the seemingly inexhaustible and involuntary stream of thoughts, perceptions, and memories flowing into consciousness. Their most common complaint concerns their inability to restrain the mind's tendency to wander and their lack of control over mental content. These Christian forms of asceticism can indeed be regarded as a type of mind training, provided we understand mind not only as the brain, but also encompassing the heart-mind and the deepest recesses of a person's being. Ascesis, according to Pierre Addo, raises the individual from an inauthentic condition of life darkened by unconsciousness and harassed by worry to an authentic state of life in which he attains self-consciousness, an exact vision of the world, inner peace and freedom. 
This is basically in agreement with specifically Christian forms of asceticism. Nicholas Berdayev writes that asceticism means the liberation of the human person, a redemption of our uniquely human dignity. Without this ascetic concentration of effort, according to Metropolitan Callistos Ware, we are at the mercy of exterior forces or of our own emotions and moods. We are reacting rather than acting. Only the ascetic is inwardly free. Viewed in this manner, asceticism emerges as a fundamentally positive endeavor in both its aims and underlying assumptions. Often, however, the negative aspects of asceticism, such as restraining the body's natural impulses, practicing extreme abstinence, enduring sleep deprivation, and adhering to strict fasting rules, receive undue emphasis, sometimes even manifesting in pathological form. Distortions of ascetic practices frequently arise when it is adopted as an end in itself, rather than being appropriately situated as a means to a broader, entirely positive goal. The profoundly optimistic assumption underlying ascetic practices is that humans possess the capacity for transformation and that our true potential is far more elevated and expansive than we typically conceive within our ordinary state of consciousness. Within Christianity, asceticism aims for the acquisition of the Holy Spirit, which fosters a gradual spiritualization and deification of the human being's entire triune structure, a dynamic process that begins during earthly life but continues beyond it. According to Metropolitan Callistos Ware, authentic Christian asceticism, unlike certain types of yoga, seeks to transfigure rather than suppress human faculties. Rather than mortifying, misdirected, passionate strivings, they are reoriented within the context of theosis. Human beings are collaborators with God's deifying energies. Instead of using psychophysiological techniques to induce specific experiences through a cause-effect relationship, Christian asceticism aims to enhance a person's receptivity or transparency to the energies of God, which continuously saturate all of creation. Asceticism insists in diminishing the barrier between us and a tangible experience of this greater divine reality, revitalizing the dormant imago dei within us. Greater interior transparency allows a more profound infusion of God's uncreated and intrinsic radiance. Avoid letting your interior life go its own way, advises a contemporary Orthodox spiritual elder, Sergei of Vanves, because inevitably it will end up on that slippery slope that leads to sin. No matter what the cost, you must resist drifting wherever the winds might take you. The elder is advocating for the practice of nepsis, a state of alert wakefulness, watchfulness, vigilance, self-monitoring, and observation. The English translators of the Philokalia refer to it as an attitude whereby one keeps watch over one's inward thoughts and fantasies, maintaining guard over the heart and intellect. Nepsis helps to preserve a state of spiritual sobriety, 
as opposed to an unreflective absorption with the images and thoughts that consume attention and elicit mechanical reactions. Ezekios the priest writes that watchfulness, nepsis, is a spiritual method which, if sedulously practiced over a long period, completely frees us with God's help from impassioned thoughts, impassioned words, and evil actions. While nepsis can be discussed as a temporary state, through repeated training in it, individuals become increasingly capable of sustaining unceasing vigilance, thereby promoting unceasing prayer. Attentiveness is a habit that develops over time as the monk gradually becomes free of the tyranny of thoughts and passions. With time and sustained practice, attentiveness becomes effortless and habitual.